What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Factory Tour. I'm your host, Paul Patterson. I'm here today with Drew Pettiford, who you might know better as Puma underscore Drew on Twitter. Uh, he's another analyst here at Dynasty Football Factory, pumping out Dynasty and Debbie content. He's got his his hands on both of those topics. Couldn't be me. I got nothing on the, the Debbie community, but <laughs> he's here today to talk some Dynasty with us, maybe tease you with a little 2024 content as well. You know, we can never look too far ahead in the rookie class. Uh, but let's let's jump right in, Drew. Let's talk a little bit about rookie drafts, the 2023 rookie drafts, because uh, like we were just saying before the show, it's been unpredictable. Like mm -hmm. the, we could not have foreseen how this class would play out. We never can. We're always more confident than we should be going into this thing. So, you know, what are some of your takeaways from this rookie class and just the rookie drafts that you've been a part of? Yeah. So, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, talk talk uh, dynasty football with you uh, today. So, um, this 2023 draft class was, of course, like we like we always do. You know, we hype it up all the way until the draft season comes around. Um, this one a little bit more in particular. We were talking about this since about 2021. How heavy this draft was going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then when the draft came around, I feel like the biggest takeaway for me was probably the drop off of running back draft capital that we saw uh you know we have gibbs and Bijan going the first round and then nothing until i believe it was charbonnet in the second and then nobody else until the third round and not great landing spots mm -hmm. so for me with how big the, the how good these running backs were you know pro profile wise that drop off just kind of tells you where the nfl values the rb position at this point so that that was kind of my biggest takeaway so far yeah for sure i mean this was a good running back class like mm -hmm. in terms of the profiles um it's just we always talk ourselves into this idea that the the nfl is gonna take these guys early because right. they're really good and the last few years we just haven't seen it right like we've seen this drop off in like you said these round two round three running backs i mean i think it was the 2020 class with jonathan taylor where we saw you know, JT, Swift, Dobbins, Akers, all going yep. around too. But since then, it's been a real drop off. You know, maybe the yeah. NFL saw how most of those guys' careers went and they were like, no thanks on the round two running backs. I don't know. Right. Uh, right. But, but yeah, we just haven't gotten that draft capital. And so that makes it especially difficult with someone like Charbonnet, who got mm -hmm. the draft capital, but gets, like you said, the, the tough spot. Um, it's what it's really done for me is it's kind of created this log jam at like, the 111, 112 range where I could make a case for so many different players, but not yeah. really feel great about any of them because some of them have better spots and then some of them are better profiles. And it's like, where do I, you know, where did the two merge? Like, what do I, what am I prioritizing here? The talent or the situation? And right. um, it's very tricky. And so I, I definitely have seen that reflected in the rookie drafts where you have very wide range of options going into that late first, early second round. Is there somebody in that range that you prefer uh once you get to once you get past the four receivers for me in jsn qj uh addison and flowers it gets real murky um if you're playing in tight end premium of course i'll take a shot on uh dalton kincaid at the end of the first mm -hmm. but other than that man i don't i don't know not to say i want to trade out of that back end or top of the second round rookie pick um you know if you're in a, a draft like that but it is just really like a you you just really got to just go get your guy at that point which usually going into the process you don't think you're going to be saying go get your guy at the end of the first round like you kind of know yeah, how that's, seriously <laughs> how that's gonna pan out you know what i mean so now you just have to kind of roll it yeah. because it's just so situation based you got to just go with your guy who do you think could win out you know who do you think has the most talent it's that now you're just relying on your own your own process at that point yeah the adp has been really wild it's it's fluctuated a lot and and honestly if you won't say it i will like trade out just trade out of the yeah, back first yeah. if, if you can you know i think a lot of leagues uh there are players that are getting wise to this teardrop where they're not going to pay up for a 111 112 versus right. like a 202 203 because it is kind of a similar tier but if somebody has a guy that they want I mean, definitely I feel comfortable moving back and getting whoever's left in that tier. Cause I think you can make a case for Devin, a chain, Zach Charbonnet, mm -hmm. 
uh, even Kendra Miller, just because he got kind of a nice spot. And then obviously I like the tight ends too. Uh, Kincaid's my one ten pick personally, if he's there and yeah, then, yeah. but, I, but I like mayor and I even like Laporta who goes a little bit later. So it's just really crowded there. And, and I would definitely be willing to, uh, take a move back. And I think more so than in most years, you can kind of draft to your team's needs at that spot where right. usually I'd say, you know, take the best guy, but it really is such a toss up. Like if your team doesn't have a tight end, like take a tight end. If your team yeah, is yeah. really rough at running back, take a running back. I don't love the wide receivers after flowers, like you mm -hmm. said. So I'm probably not going wide receiver there. My yep. wide receiver five is Marvin Mims, who you can usually get a little later in the second round. Right. Uh, but you know, I've seen arguments for guys like Jonathan Mingo, even mm -hmm. in the early second, that's a guy I'm not getting at all. Um, I, I'm just not a fan of the profile. I see the idea with the opportunity there in Carolina, yeah. but I, he's just getting pushed up so much for a guy who just, I don't see it, you know, in the numbers and in his profile, he's an older player, not as productive. So he's a guy I haven't gotten a single share of through like eight or nine rookie drafts. Is yeah. there a guy like that for you where every time you come up on the clock, you know, you just can't press the button on this guy or, or maybe they've just kind of avoided you based on the picks you've had. Um, Mingo's close up there. Um, another guy, another receiver like that, that I've seen myself not really wanting to, to press the button on is, uh, is Josh Downs. Um, I like Josh Downs as a player. I'm just not, especially if you're, if you're contending now, Josh Downs, I feel like is in the same development scheme as a Anthony Richardson would be. So they have weapons there. They're a run first offense. I don't see where Josh Downs immediately carves out a a uh, a share for himself in that offense right right off the bat. So I'm one of my biggest leagues. I'm you know in a win now window, and for Josh Downs at that spot, I'm just kind of like uh, he's gonna take a little bit. You know, and somebody, some people could say that for JSM because Lockett's there as well in Seattle. Um, but I just, I don't know if he's going to get the the volume right off the bat in that type of offense, especially if we don't know if Anthony Richardson has passing volume like that, if he's, you know, kind of these, one of these Konami code uh, QB. So I'm just a little, I'm a little nervous about downs when it comes yeah. to the draft. Yeah, I, t I totally agree with you there, actually. I, I think he's a great talent. Um, mm -hmm. It's just such a combination of, negative factors with the Richardson spot, you know, because we don't know if he can even throw basically. And we don't know how much he's going to throw probably right. not at a high rate, just based on what we've seen from other Russian quarterbacks. And, right. you know, like you said, JSN's in similar spot, but you know, he's a first round pick. He's a superior prospect. He's in yeah. an offense that's going to throw more passes with an established quarterback. So I'm still willing to take the shot on him. I don't think yeah, he's going to, I don't think he's going to carry your team in year one necessarily, but he has a better shot to make an impact. Whereas downs is just, he's got a tough path because even, even, you know, two wide receiver sets, you, I very think it's very likely you'll still see Alec Pierce and Michael Pittman just because yeah, Pierce yeah. is a good blocker. He's more of an outside, you know, field stretcher type. And so you might even see downs limited on his route percentage, which is not a good thing to see in an offense. that's already going to have low volume. Right. Right. That's my, my thoughts exactly on down. And I'm, you know, a big fan of Josh Downs. He was my wide receiver five pre-draft. Um, and it's just his landing spot. I was just like, oh, man, like the landing spot strikes again. You know what I mean? So, yeah, sometimes you have to wrong, do that. Sometimes yeah. you just got to be yeah. flexible. It's like you can like these guys pre-draft, but then if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You know, right. you got to right. got to stay fluid, got to adjust to the new circumstances. And the thing is with Downs is like if he's good, you can probably still go get him for an achievable like and then. Right. And, he's not going to be impossible to get if he flashes some ability, right? Cause he's right. not going to be putting up massive production in that offense regardless. So if he looks like a good target earner, you, you go make an offer for him. You can yeah. probably still pick him up close to his, his current cost. Um, all right. Well, perfect. We are not done talking about rookies on this show. Rookies are going to come up throughout this show, but what we're going to do here is we're going to look at things from a different perspective. And we're going to talk about some risers and fallers, uh, among the veteran players in the NFL. So who had their situations change due to the NFL draft? Who's rising? Who's falling? And obviously, we will touch on the rookies that are causing those rises and those falls. Uh, and so what we want to do here is we're just going to take each player. We'll talk a little bit about their situation, how it's changed, uh, how has their range of outcomes changed, 
and what's the market doing with these players? And then finally, you know, what is our, what is our goal with these players? If we have them on our teams or if we don't, are we buying, selling, holding, what are we doing? And let's just start with some rising players. Uh, Drew, do you have a veteran player that's on the rise after the NFL draft? Yeah, so the first one that, that comes to mind for me, and I wouldn't even call him a, a veteran. Uh, he's only been in the league for a year. But uh, immediately, I would think of Rashad White. Um, they didn't do too much at the in the draft at all when it comes to the running back room. Uh, I believe they brought in Sean Tucker after the draft. They signed him mm -hmm. when the draft was over so as a free agent. Um, so we don't know the story with Sean Tucker's, uh, any of his tape, his co combine that he did, his, uh, his health, any of that, any of that stuff. So that's kind of a wild card. So I'm not really considering that factoring that in right now. Um, Rashad White's a good player. I like him. I liked him last year in 2022 coming out. And I think he has, uh, a really good opportunity to finish, um, you know, in, in honestly in the top 15, uh, next year for for running backs just based off of volume and being the only show in town and bringing in Baker Mayfield uh, to play QB we know he's not running any type of high powered you know high octane mm -hmm. passing passing offense um, but even if they do if they want to dial it up a little bit and let him sling the rock Rashad White's uh, a really good pass catcher um, so I I like that they didn't do anything for his fantasy you know for his fantasy outlook of course um and he's young. He he showed a lot of flash last year. Uh, big stiff arm and one of those one of those highlights we saw uh, in the middle of the season once he got that that role when Leonard Fournette was out. So uh, I think he's a big winner after the draft. Um, and I love his spot. I'm looking to I'm actually looking to trade for him a little bit uh, right now before the before the season and summer camp. I mean the uh, uh, off season camps get rolling. So yeah, I don't think you can disagree with. Rashad White being a winner, you know, they didn't draft a single running back. Leonard Fournette's still hanging out on the on the waiver wire, and yep. they seem comfortable at the moment uh, with just Rashad White. Uh, Chase Edmonds, I believe, is on the roster, and then That's right. yep. Sean Tucker, who they signed as an undrafted free agent. I like him. Honestly, I've been picking him up in rookie drafts, like fourth mm -hmm. round, because I did like his profile, and it's yeah, possible yeah. he fell out of the draft due to his medical concerns, but you certainly can't factor in a UDFA as like a significant threat uh, to an incumbent running back. So that's all projection at this point. Right now, Rashad White looks like the clear leader in the clubhouse. Now, mm -hmm. I will say, I think we're going to agree, you and I, on most of these players, mm -hmm. uh, but I think Rashad White is one where we disagree because he's not actually a guy that... I'm looking to acquire in dynasty and, and I'm not so sure how good he really is. Um, okay. I did, I did like his profile in college, excellent pass catcher. I think he did show that pass catching ability as a rookie, but as a rusher, um, I do have some numbers here. I, I recognize that Tampa Bay had a poor offensive line, but these numbers together have me pretty concerned. Uh, his rushing grade, I believe this is, per PFF, I forgot to write it down, uh, 53rd out of 60 qualified running backs. His yards after contact per attempt was 58th, uh, explosive run percentage 57th, and then his rushing yards over expected per attempt 42nd out of 48 qualified running backs. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm looking at there is a guy who's maybe not so strong as a rusher, um, and I'm, I'm kind of concerned just in that offense under Baker Mayfield where it isn't going to be a high-powered offense. Yep. And you're also not going to be that afraid of the passing game necessarily. Right. Uh, you know, how is that efficiency going to work out? I still think he has a great shot to get a lot of volume. It's just the kind of guy that I'm not eager to bet on in dynasty where the projection mm -hmm. is so fragile, right? Mm -hmm. Like players where I feel like their volume is earned. I'm more willing to go in and buy those players where right. this is a situation where I feel like volume is being given more so than earned. And so that makes me wary. I think for redraft, he's, he's probably a nice pick because like you said, there's nobody there and he is going to get a lot of touches, but yeah. Any thoughts on that? Like any concern about him, just his rushing ability and if that could affect him, you know, in the near term or the long term? Yeah, definitely. You brought out, you brought out a good point, especially with those, the numbers from, from PFF. He's not, you know, not the purest runner, not efficient. Um, I just don't, he's, he's young. And so is that not, I wouldn't say the offense is young, but they're going to, I just feel like his volume is going to stick around for a while enough so that he'll get enough volume and can hopefully improve on that. The offensive line was bad last year. It's a Tom Brady led offense. Uh, I think if they make 
you know, some changes to that to that team. I don't know what they're going to do with the receivers long term, but I do like his his outlook maybe in a, you know, a dynasty running back window the next two, three years. I don't mind taking a shot on him, especially if you're on the verge of contending. You need, you know, an RB2, one of your flex spots. I don't mind taking a shot on Rashad White based on his volume, but I do agree with you that he's not he's not going to turn into one of these like earned volume type of guys. Like you said, he's kind of just going to get it because they don't have anybody else and they need him to carry low because we we all know at this point, Chase Edmonds is not a viable option <laughs> yeah. in, in any spot he's been in. We've, we've given him a couple chances now in the past two, three seasons. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think he's any like a, a pure rusher, like you you were saying, the numbers show it, but uh, I do like his, his upside based on, based on that team that he's on right now being by himself. Yeah, I, I think his his price is still palatable. You know, uh, he saw a little spike after the draft up to RB20, but for whatever mm-hmm. reason, uh, this is per keep trade cut. For whatever reason, he's down to RB24 again as of today, okay. which is right around where he was pre-draft. Um, so I don't think he's, he's not cost prohibitive by any means. Like you can mm-hmm. go out and get a guy valued RB24. That's not that expensive a buy in Dynasty. I will say I would probably wait just because it's only May. And yeah. you don't have any needs in May, so you don't need to go get him because you need a running back. And if they do re-sign Leonard Fournette, they bring in Ezekiel Elliott. Um, right. Whether or not you think that will affect the projection significantly, that is going to affect the market's perception of him mm-hmm. as a player. And so if you see them bring in some dusty veteran, that's my, that might be when you want to go out and shoot your offers for Rashad White. Right. Um, my last bit of pushback on White is just what I see coming for this offense because – Tampa was second in running back targets last season with 147. Uh, They were also first in pass attempts, first in place per game, and first in pass rate. And so, you know, that's the Tom Brady effect. That's how he wants to run his offense. And so I'm concerned with just how the volume is going to look in that post-Brady offense with either Mayfield or if they end up going with Kyle Trask or something. You know, what's that going to look like? the, The raw volume could come down. That's true. Which is going to really hurt the the bottom line. But to me, I mean, he looks like what you said, probably an RB2 projection due to volume. And um, if he gets enough volume, he's still going to produce. So certainly not a bad guy to pick up. He certainly is winning from the draft. Can't agree, I can't disagree with you there. I'm going to go ahead and jump to a guy who I think is in kind of a similar situation, uh, which is Tony Pollard. Uh, he's oh, another yeah. draft winner where... He, he's got kind of a vacant depth chart behind him. It's Tony Pollard followed by Malik Davis, followed by Ronald Jones and followed by Deuce Vaughn. If you think, you know, he can play running back. I don't, I'm not sure yeah. if five foot five, he's really a threat. seems like more of a special teams player, but right, regardless, right. Pollard's got nothing behind him. The difference for me with Pollard is just that I think his volume is earned. Like I think he pushed his way into a role last season that he's not giving up. And I think he is an elite player like all around and so Mm -hmm. i think it's wheels up for pollard like i'm looking at him with kind of a top five ceiling this season Mm -hmm. and and i think he's worthy of rb1 consideration and dynasty where you at with pollard post draft yeah so i mean pre-draft i was in love with tony pollard as soon as they cut zeke you know price went up and then as soon as the draft was over price went up again um I 100% agree with you on this player. He definitely has top five potential in Dynasty. Um, it's a mixture of volume base, plus he's really like that. He's he's good. He's a really good player. Um, you know, the former receiver, and then once you convert a receiver to a running back in Dynasty, if you're playing PPR, which everybody is at this point in, in fantasy football, that's a that's a dangerous player on that on that Dallas Cowboys uh, offense. Their O line, they're scoring a ton of points. They're top five in points scored past three seasons. Um, that's like you just said. That's it's wheels up, and they're we're not we're not going to talk about Ronald Jones, Malik Davis, <laughs> no. and and Deuce Vaughn. Like I'm sorry, the Deuce Vaughn story is great. It really like it really is. I'm rooting for the guy. I'm a Cowboys fan myself, so I'm rooting for the guy. But this is not one of those. This is a Tony Pollard show. I don't see them bringing in anybody. Um, other than the, I mean, they just drafted one. It's really late, but I, I don't see it's they're they're giving him the rock. He's on the franchise tag, but he's getting you know all the volume. He's basically never going to come off the field. I don't think. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, go ahead. 
Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree with you. I think he's going to get a big uh, share of the opportunity. I don't know if he's the kind of guy where we should expect like 300 plus touches. So no, I feel like no. whoever's behind him on the depth chart, like they're going to get some carries. Yeah. Just, it, but it's Pollard is going to be on the field in those high leverage situations. And exactly. he's going to, he's going to get the receiving work and he's going to get his, you know, 16, 17, 18 touches per game. And then everybody else kind of comes after. So right. that's, that's kind of what we're thinking. It's not like, well, you know, everybody Zeke is gone and now Pollard gets every touch. It's more like yeah. we know that his role is steady. And, you know, last season we saw down the stretch, he was a top five running back. He mm -hmm. was getting 17, 18 touches per game. That's all he needs. He doesn't need Derrick Henry volume because right. he's so efficient and he does add that big playability, especially through the air. So that's what we're banking on. Honestly, I wouldn't even be surprised if they brought Zeke back later in the yeah, offseason. And, 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 but if they did, it wouldn't change my thoughts because no. Pollard already kind of took over that backfield late last season. Zeke yeah. just doesn't have it anymore. And the right. fact that if, if they're going to turn around and give the Ronald Jones carries to Ezekiel Elliott, I don't, I'm not really worried about that, you know? So he's right. a guy that I'm willing to go and get in dynasty. If I'm trying to go all in and contend and mm -hmm. I can get him cheaper than some of those bigger name players ahead of him. But like you right. said, his price has been getting up there. Uh, you know, I yeah. think he's yeah. currently in that RB 12 zone on keep trade cut. So okay. Is that a price you feel comfortable paying? I think he's right around Ramondre Stevenson, Josh Jake, a little behind Josh Jacobs. Does that okay. seem about right? He's 26 years old, so it's not like he's still a young guy. Yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, I I would be comfortable with that because, like you said, he, he's never gotten uh, anywhere near you know over 200 touches or carries in a season in any of his years he's been in Dallas. So mm -hmm. we haven't seen like tons of tread being taken off of his tires yet um not a whole bunch of volume of course with zeke being there they're just good they were feeding him the rock for the past few years so um but i think that's a, a comfortable spot especially given his um his passing repertoire that he can bring uh you know like you said he's going to be on the field when it counts when it matters when fantasy points come so i don't I, would i put him yeah i'm taking him uh, over Ramondre Stevenson, if it's in that range, that that price tag, I feel comfortable, especially this for this season. If you're going for it now, mm -hmm. like you said, 26 year old running back, but in that offense, he's not like you say, he's not running it 300 times. He's not Derrick Henry. He's not doesn't have a huge build, but he's going to get the ball when the points can be scored. So I'll 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 take that at that price. Yeah, for sure. Honestly, he kind of reminds me of like Aaron Jones, and just in mm -hmm. terms of his, you know, his size, his rushing efficiency. Yeah. Uh, never, never like a massive volume guy, but just always efficient and contributes in the ways that score fantasy points. And so right. we could kind of see him age that same way where he can maybe hold on to his efficiency a little later into his career, whether yeah. it be due to lower volume or just his style of play. Uh, so I do think he's, he's got a nice shot to produce here for a few seasons and, mm -hmm. uh, where I have him, I'm trying to hold on to him. And if I can snag him from somebody at a discount who thinks, you know, Zeke is coming back and that's a problem or who thinks he's over the hill or whatever they might think I I'm definitely trying to swoop in and grab him. Yeah. I have seen some people be a little nervous that if Z comes back, what do I do with TP now? And I'm like, guys, they let him go for re obviously for money reasons, but they see something in Tony Pollard, obviously they franchise tag him. So long-term might not be the, you know, might not be the direction Cowboys go in, but if you want a solid running back, that's going to get you points immediately. Tony Pollard is a guy you should be targeting. So. Yeah. And, and with the franchise tag, it's like he is on a one year deal in Dallas, but it, mm -hmm. he's he's shown his talent to such a degree that it's like, I guess I'm just not that worried about what's going to happen next. No. It's like he's no. kind of proven himself. So that's where I see it as differently to someone like Rashad White and not that they're the same value or anything, mm -hmm. but just where I see it differently, where he's going to get a role somewhere right. as like right. a, as a, like a lead back because he has shown it last season, I think. And what he'll do this season, it's like, he, he'll land on his feet wherever he is. If he's not in Dallas, he's yeah. going to find a spot. Uh, whereas some of these other running backs, it's just a little bit more fragile. That's why we're always seeing running backs rising and falling because it's all about who's on the team, who's getting the volume. Um, so with, with that being said, I, I'm pretty sure your next riser is another running back. Do you want to throw that name out there for us and, and we'll jump into him? Yeah. So the other guy that I had that, you know, was kind of a draft weekend winner. Uh, I would say is Damian Pierce of the Houston Texans. I'm not a huge fan of Damian Pierce, just to 
a disclaimer before I before I start. Uh, I don't. I'm not really a fan of his running style. I'm not re- like. I don't think he doesn't do much for me when it comes to, you know, fantasy outlook in dynasty. Um, however, in this offense with a new quarterback, with not really adding too much in that running back room, uh, he's his price or his you know arc i should say from last year kind of stays the same he got the volume he got a ton of yards last year he played really well for his rookie season um and i think he holds on to that role of being the rb1 in houston um i don't really think that they're going to be throwing it all over the yard in houston uh to start off especially with a rookie quarterback um so i think his his price kind of holds um, I traded him away when I, I drafted him last year in the rookie draft, traded him away for a, a 2023 first. So I will take that. I don't, I'm not sure how it played out, which pick I had. I've traded so many times since then, but um, mm-hmm. like just cause I wasn't, I didn't believe in the draft capital didn't believe in the value of him. He's kind of a North South hammer type of runner. Doesn't do much in the, in the passing game. N- not enough for me, at least as a, as a dynasty player, but, um, but yeah, he, he, you know, his value kind of holds. He's, I don't see his role going anywhere. So, yeah, Pierce has been kind of an interesting ride, right? Because he did come in <laughs> as a fourth round pick. Yep. Um, he landed on an empty depth chart. He got a whole bunch of volume. He got a bunch of hype even before the season had started mm-hmm. to the yep. point that people were already sending away their 23 firsts to get yep. Damian Pierce. And I was right there leading the, the charge against <laughs> the 23 firsts. Oh, there's my cat trying to get into the show. Um, <laughs> leading the charge on, you know, don't trade a 2023 first for Damian Pierce. And now I'm looking here at the late first in 2023, and I'm wondering, was I actually right? Uh, Because, you know, if I'm choosing at the late first between, like, Dalton Kincaid or Devin Achain or Zach Charbonnet versus Damian Pierce, I'm probably taking Pierce at this point. And so, uh, you know, it depends on whether you're where your pick ended up. I still think it was bad process if you were moving your first for him. Like you said, kind of a cap ceiling player. Mm -hmm. But... It certainly has worked out so far that he, Texans added Devin Singletary, uh, which yeah, doesn't so. really worry me. That's like <laughs> that's just like the new Rex Burkhead for them. Exactly. Uh, and otherwise, Pierce is the guy. He's going to get that high opportunity share. I don't mm-hmm. think he'll be sixth in opportunity share like he was last season. That's a no. little crazy, but he's going to get a lot of touches in a yeah. probably mediocre offense. Yeah, I would call uh, it. Yeah, yeah, I would call that. I would call that offense uh, mediocre, and that's no knock on uh cj stroud of course that's i'm I'm a fan of cj stroud I'm not it's they you know they added a couple weapons for him to kind of kind of get going get his get his feet wet but damian pierce just kind of came out of this unscathed when it comes to from a, a fantasy aspect he's still going to be able to do what he did i, I mean I, I i'm a fan of him when it comes to like a go get it type of like he's tough he's a tough running back um it's just a matter of the offense isn't that great and he doesn't offer anything else other than putting his head down and trying to, you know, run somebody over. And I, I don't mm-hmm. see him being that, that elusive in space. It's just, he's just a North South, which is, it's, it's good for real football. Just not what I'm looking for, for, you know, my, one of my RB studs, but, yeah, I think my, my problem with Pierce is the same as you. It's just a ceiling question, right? Mm-hmm. When we're If we're rostering running backs in Dynasty, especially ones that hold a lot of value, you really want them to have a ceiling because the, the value can evaporate very quickly. Mm-hmm. And, and so there's an opportunity cost to holding these running backs where that value can go up in smoke. So you better be getting something valuable out of it while you hold that player on your roster. And with Pierce, it's just hard to envision something better than like, high end RB2 production because mm-hmm. he caps out at like a 10% target share at best, uh, you know, on an offense with a rookie quarterback, that's not going to score a lot of points. Yep. So it's, it's tough, you know, at his cost where he's going around RB 16, RB 17, that's just kind of a dead zone for me where I'm looking to move up into like a Pollard or a Ramondre. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm looking to move down into a similar arc type of player. Right. Uh, like like the guy that I'm about to talk about, which is Isaiah Pacheco. I'll talk about him in a second. But is there anything else you wanted to add on Pierce? Yeah, I would just say if you're in the in the space and you're on your team where you are looking for a running back, like you need a guy, I think that this is somebody you should be targeting, somebody you can be targeting if you're looking to make a playoff run, make any type of you know move towards 
a championship. And this is, I'm not saying this as a, a top 12 guy. He's just a piece that will get volume and that'll get you points. Similar to um, the running back I was talking about earlier. You know, it's not going to be somebody that's, you know, going to be a world beater, but their their values is somewhat insulated on a on a volume basis. Yeah, my, I agree with you that they can definitely contribute to contending teams. My problem with these RB2 types is always just that by midseason, we see so many running backs pop up that yep. are doing similar things. You know, like you think of like a Deontay Foreman last season right. where that's a guy you could have just flipped a third round pick for. And, yep. and now you're getting similar production to that like mid-range RB2. And so that's why I'm always kind of hesitant to be heavily invested in any of these RB2 types because I feel like there are other ways to manufacture that production that don't yeah. involve giving away kind of high-end assets. Right. Um, but right. but if you it's all it's always about acquisition cost. But if you can get him and and feel good about your RB2 spot, that's certainly there's certainly worse players to have there. Yeah. Um, yeah. He exactly. just yeah, he just kind of him personally, he she's he still has the keys in Houston, so Exactly. For so whatever that's keys. worth. Yeah. <laughs> and it seems like Isaiah Pacheco has the keys in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. was another guy, a rookie last season, seventh rounder, who made a name for himself, kind of kicked uh, Clyde edwards Hilaire to the curb. And it was just another guy where I was waiting for the shoe to drop, right? Like, I didn't want to hold on to any of my shares because he's a seventh round rookie. Seventh round rookies don't usually keep their jobs, right? Even mm -hmm. if they do play well in the playoffs, it's just one of those things. They always get churned. They get re replaced. But Kansas City, whether maybe they've learned from their mistakes with Clyde edwards Hilaire, maybe they just really, really like Pacheco, but they've kept this running back room intact. It's it's mm -hmm. Isaiah Pacheco. They brought back Jarek McKinnon, yeah. and Clyde edwards Hilaire is still hanging around on the depth chart. So I kind of see this playing out, you know, how we saw at the end of last season mm -hmm. where Pacheco's getting the majority of the running back rushes. Uh, he was around a 69% running back rush share from week 12 on through the playoffs. So he was their obvious favorite in the running back rotation. And then McKinnon was getting that receiving work. And that's how I expect it to play out. Yeah. I, so I, it's funny. Isaiah Pacheco was a guy that I, in a lot of my rookie drafts last year, didn't draft. Obviously we'll do a three round rookie draft five, five round, whatever the case is. And I was just kind of waited, didn't say too much because I got a, I have a couple leagues like home dynasty leagues group with my friends and everything. And uh, I just kind of waited around until, you know, the free agency opened as soon as the draft ends. And I tried to grab Isaiah Pacheco and almost all of them just because I liked his his style of running. And of course, he gets a little bit of bump when you get drafted by Kansas City. And he, everybody does. Every player does since since Mahomes has been there. So I kind of waited around for that um and held on to him stashed him for a little bit and he ended up you know starting to starting to turn into a thing uh in the kansas city backfield um i love that they didn't go crazy trying to figure out anything with that running back room for now they they could you know they could ha assign one of these free agent running backs that's still out there there's a, there's a few of them a few uh a few guys with name cachet as well uh but I I love his his situation. He's kind of the thunder and lightning with him and Jarek McKinnon. Uh, I think his his role in the Kansas City offense is is pretty insulated, and he shows a lot of pop. Um, so I think he's a a great a great buy and a great winner after the draft. Yeah, you know I I was able to pick up a few shares. He was a great target late. He's the kind of guy you always want to go for in the third, fourth, fifth round of rookie drafts, or even mm -hmm. off waivers, like you said. These running backs that have interesting profiles that especially go to shallow depth charts or mm -hmm. good, good offenses, because all it takes is like an injury or a coach's decision. And now they're getting a whole bunch of touches. And so it's a lot, it's a lot quicker path than these like <laughs> six round wide receivers, seventh round wide receivers that people like to, to hype up. Yeah. Um, but I'm always going to take the Isaiah Pacheco over like the Romeo Dobbs types personally. That's just how I roll. Like I think, Dobbs with that fourth round capital, somebody like him was somebody yep. that people were interested in, like going to an Aaron Rodgers offense. But I just look at the hit rates for these day three wide receivers and, and I'm like, give me the running back every time. Like, yeah, I'll yeah. give me, give me Zach Evans, give me yep. Sean Tucker, give me Chase Brown. Like, I want all these guys on my on my squads because they could all go the Isaiah Pacheco route if things break right. their way. 
what what it uh, is too is as as running backs you know throughout the season always find their way on the field at some point because running backs are getting banged up they're getting replaced uh you know things happen throughout the nfl season so for a running back to get a shot like who thought we were going to see you know bam night last year for the jets like exactly if, you know if you're watching college you know okay yeah he's on the jets but nobody thought he was going to have any type of role but you know running back is such a volatile position it's always you know it's ever moving especially with injury so taking shots like that you know a little bit offside but taking shots like that as opposed to on third round receivers is definitely definitely the way to go for in my opinion as well no man i love when the show delves into the game theory weeds that's really what i like i'm much <laughs> i'm much more of a of a game theory guy than a strict player take kind of guy but uh yeah with, with running back it's it's one of those positions where like we said earlier in the show volume is given Mm -hmm. So somebody has to get touches. And when the starter goes down, the backups got to get the touches. So really you just need these guys to get on the depth chart. Like if right. Cam Akers gets hurt this, hurt this year, I expect Zach Evans to get the touches. If Rashad yep. White gets hurt, you could see Sean Tucker get the touches. If Joe Mixon gets hurt, Chase Brown's going to get touches. And by getting touches, they're going to score fantasy points. Even if they're not very good, they're still going to score fantasy points, especially right. if they're in good right. offenses. So it's just one of those things where it makes more sense on your dynasty benches because you look at someone like Jonathan Mingo, like we just said, he's going to be a day one starter for the Panthers, mm -hmm. and he is not assured anything. Like, yes, he's going to get snaps. He still has to run routes and get open, and he needs to earn a target from Bryce Young to actually score a fantasy point. There's no guarantee he can do that, right? right. We don't know that he can earn targets, but we certainly know that if Chase Brown is standing next to Joe Burrow when the ball is snapped, he can get the ball on a handoff. Like, that, right. that doesn't right. require any ability. So that's why I like taking those shots. But yeah, jumping back to Pacheco here, I kind of see him as an arbitrage opportunity to Damian Pierce, where mm -hmm. I look at how he was used down the stretch, and I just don't see a huge difference to the way Pierce was used. He's getting the bulk of the running back opportunities. A um, little lower target share. He was hanging out around the 6 7% range versus Pierce, who is around 10% for the season. Mm -hmm. But we're also talking about a much better offense, much more volume, right. more scoring opportunities. So I look at Pacheco, who's down in like the RB 24, 25 range, and that just seems like a more appealing bet to make when you're looking at players with similar ceilings. Yeah. So, you know, looking at their values in a vacuum, I, I would prefer to pick Pacheco where he's going as opposed to Pierce. And if I had Pierce, yeah. I'd be willing to trade down to Pacheco and get something extra because at the end of the day, they're both a guy you can put in your RB2 slot and just mm -hmm. feel okay about. And so I'd rather just have the guy that costs less. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And I honestly, I like, I like Pacheco as a player better than I like Damian Pierce. Like, regardless, they do have a similar, very similar run style. And, you know, they kind of want to, they're kind of looking for contact a little bit, like a heat seeking missile out there. But, you know, Pacheco, I do like a little bit better. better. And like you said, he's in the, He's in the Chiefs offense, so he's he definitely gets a. If you can make a deal for an RB two with a little bit of something extra on it, I, I I do that as well. All right, perfect, love that. So those are our four risers. That's Rashad White, Tony Pollard, Damian Pierce, Isaiah Pacheco, all running backs. Um, running backs are just uniquely positioned to benefit or uh, fall due to the results of the draft. Like we said, the, the way the depth charts are stacked up. Uh, mm -hmm. It just plays out that way over here on the side of the fallers though. We do have a couple more running backs. We also have some non running backs. I promise you. So <laughs> let's start things off here. Who didn't have a great draft weekend? Who is falling down the dynasty rankings? And uh, let's see if that's warranted or not. Why don't you start us off again, Drew? Uh, yeah. So first guy that came to mind after the draft uh, was Kenneth Walker uh, running back for uh, Seattle Seahawks. Um, of course, he's you know in most people at the at the time, at least pre-draft, uh, top five dynasty running back. Uh, played excellent last year. Um, you know, got yardage, did a lot in a in a small amount of games. He didn't play the full season. Um, you know, and he looked like the guy. He looked like he can carry. You know, three down load can take two hundred fifty plus carries. He looks like that. And then here comes Zach Charbonnet in the second round, um, who is also another power back with receiving in his in his uh, in his arsenal. So right off the bat, that's two potential. You could you could say for either of those players, it's kind of just like you know putting two two magnets 
on the, on the opposite ends. <laughs> right. Just watch them go like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just not, it's mm-hmm. not good for, for us as dynasty players. It's not, it's not a good landing spot for Charbonnet and for Kenneth Walker's ceiling. It gets, it gets capped, especially, you know, this year right off the bat, because in the NFL, especially based on how we saw them draft running backs in the draft, if they're taking one in the second round, he was the third running back off the board. They're going to use him. It's Pete Carroll. It's Seattle. They're going to run the ball. Um, and they're going to pass the ball to Charbonnet and let Kenneth Walker do all the running and do a little bit more of the dirty work, which it, that's what it looks like it's going to be for me. Um, so I just, yeah, Kenneth Walker takes takes a bit of a hit here after the 2023 draft. Yeah, for sure. He's got to be one of your biggest fallers, especially because he's falling from such a great height. Uh, he yeah. was RB4 on keep trade cut prior to the draft. He's currently at RB8. I think that's still too high personally. Um, yeah. I was out on Walker beforehand at his price mm-hmm. just because of the lack of receiving upside. He had a poor college profile in terms of receiving and then capped out at a 7% target share as a rookie, which is the same like we said about like Pierce and Pacheco. It's just that mm-hmm. he's so much more expensive. Like I'm looking for more of that ceiling there. So I thankfully had zero shares on my dynasty teams of Kenneth uh-huh. Walker, uh, but I was bummed to kind of see Charbonnet land there where he was a guy I was excited to get in the late first. And now it's much less exciting because these guys, like you said, are both going to get work. It's unlikely that either one of them is going to overtake the other completely. So right. we're looking at a situation where, you know, maybe you have two RB twos, but you're not going to get RB one production out of either guy without an injury to the other. It's kind of right. like a worse version of Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon in my mind. Yeah. Because, because like the skill sets are kind of like crisscrossed where like, at least with Aaron Jones, he's efficient and he has the pass catching. But in in, yeah, in Seattle, it's like Kenneth Walker's the efficient runner and then Charbonnet has the pass catching. And so it's kind of like both guys, both of these guys have something to bring to the table, but neither of them is going to be able to do enough on their volume to really stand out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, so it's, yeah, I, I struggle to see the upside for either guy at this point. I think Charbonnet will play the third downs. He might get some short yardage. Walker's yeah. still going to be their, their main rusher i would assume just due to his explosive ability mm-hmm. but man yeah, I, he's a he's a home run hitter man so like they're they're definitely like this is written on the walls like it's writing on the walls i should say that they're 100 using this as a tandem but like these are their two guys it's not the kenneth walker show which is why it sucks that this happened because a lot of us were thinking this would be the Kenneth Walker show. They have all the receivers. They just drafted JSN. They re-upped Geno Smith. You know, they have Metcalf and Lockett still like, okay, this is looking like it's going to be his, you know, his show, his backfield. And they're telling us right off, especially with the draft capital, like, nope, that's not going to happen. We're going to, we'd rather play, you know, play it smart, save these guys for the long haul and do a actual committee. Like a 50 50 split can be, I think I could just, I could see you now. That's what's going to happen. So, yeah, that hits, it hits hard. So, if you have Walker on your dynasty team, what what's the next move? Oh, man. So, this is personal for me because I have him on my dynasty team. So, <laughs> I haven't done, I haven't done anything yet. Um, I have, so I have in one of my leagues, I have Brees and Kenneth Walker. So, I thought I was last year, I was, you know, I, I got Brees at this, this offseason during, during the injury, you know, in probably January, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, now with, with Kenneth Walker, I'm probably going to be looking to, I'm going to be looking to move off him because my, the rest of my squad's like ready to go. And I, I kind of need to, you know, I don't want to say go get, go get a, a veteran. Cause I don't want to, you know, the veteran running backs to drop off at any point, but I am looking to move him and get a little bit, a little bit back for him to make a run. So I just don't, I don't see him helping me enough to. To yeah. get a championship, he's not going to get the volume. So, to be honest, I I would be looking to flip him for like a Josh Jacobs, like yeah, yeah, somebody yeah. who you know is going to get the volume, who can actually give you that top five season. Mm-hmm. Uh, because with Walker at this point, it's like he is young, but the the allure of these young running back, these young elite running backs, is the elite part, right? Like being young right. is fine, but there are a lot of young running backs. It's <laughs> it's the young running backs that have clear runway to elite production, you know, like a right, Brees Hall. Right like a uh, Jameer Gibbs now, like a uh, Bijan Robinson and, and Walker doesn't have that now. Like he's, no. he's sharing a backfield with Charbonnet for the next several years, barring a trade or something. And mm. so 
with a guy that already didn't have the pass catching juice that we are looking for, I I'm just, I'm jumping off the, like if, okay, if I had him on my team, I would be jumping off of this sinking ship. I would yeah. be, and, and it sucks to sell low. Like it really sucks to have something, somebody worth the RB four price last week. And now you're selling him for Josh Jacobs and right, that's, right. that's miserable. But at the same time, I think we could see his value, his value depress even further as people start to actually wrap their heads around <clears throat> what the situation is going to be here in Seattle. Right. It looks, it looks bleak for both of those guys, unfortunately. And like, I, I was pretty high on Charbonnet. He was almost my two in this draft. He's always almost my running back too. Um, so it's just, they, they both get capped. It'd be great for Seattle. It's great. It's, it's, it's real nice for Seattle, but not for us. So. Yeah. I, I, yeah, exactly. So unfortunately, Kenneth Walker is falling down the ranks and, uh, and I'll throw out another running back so that we can yeah. be done with the running back talk. And that's Deandre <laughs> Swift. The other, the other running back who had a running back added to his team, a high profile one, Jameer Gibbs with the 12th overall pick joins the lions equally shocking, if not more so than the Charbonnet pick. Uh, honestly, the draft throws you for a loop every year, but this one felt oh, yeah. especially bizarre. Uh, so Promptly thereafter, DeAndre Swift is traded to the Eagles for a fourth round pick in some season, 2025 or 2038 or something. Uh, and so now he's got a new situation. Gibbs steps into to Detroit as the RB1, but the Swift fallout was quick. It was Swift. Uh, he fell from <laughs> RB23 to, to he, he fell all the way down to RB23 right after the Gibbs pick, and then he recovered to RB18 following the Philly trade. So mm -hmm. there seems to be some optimism about the landing spot in Philadelphia on paper. It's not a, it's not that imposing of a situation, right? We have Rashad Penny who has, despite being a very efficient runner has never really commanded the kind of volume uh, and respect in a backfield that right. he was expected to as a first round pick. And then we have Kenneth Gainwell, who's kind of, you know, a situational player. And so people mm -hmm. seem to think that Swift could capture the lead role here. Are you optimistic on that front or what are you doing with Swift after this move? Um yeah, I mean it's 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 good that he ended up on the on the Eagles because if he went any, anywhere else he would have been sunk in lower than 23, I think. Uh Eagles is a perfect spot for DeAndre Swift. I just don't think his ceiling gets any higher than it was in Detroit. And of course this is a run run heavy offense, number one rushing offense in the league last year. Uh but I just don't see how much more they're going to use or how much differently they're going to use him than they did Miles Sanders last year. And Miles Sanders had a good year. He, he, he you know, over a thousand yards, um, you know, he had a productive season. It's just that when you bring in Rashad Penny and you get DeAndre Swift for, you know, a bag of footballs, basically, yeah. I don't see that they're going to be, you know, giving him this, you know, 25 touches per game type of role. They got four running backs that they throw in situationally um so he's i mean he's he's super talented super talented running back i just don't think that obviously detroit didn't see it because he can't really stay on the field that so since he's been in the league that we've seen and then when you go to the eagles that's they don't they don't run a one running back type of offense they they just run the ball, especially you have your run your quarterbacks a rushing quarterback too. So that that kind of caps the ceiling as well. So yeah, I think it was really key what you said about the investment, right? Like they they did not give up a lot for DeAndre Swift. There there is nothing no. assured to him in the same way that there there is volume assured to a B. John Robinson, a Jameer Gibbs, even a Zach Charbonnet based on the investment from the team. That's right. not the case with Swift and. Honestly, I, I don't really like the spot. I, it's definitely better than Detroit, but mm. you know, we're looking at a team that was dead last in running back targets last season. Right. Uh, and that's largely due to the mobile quarterback. It's also just due to the, the way this offense runs, mm -hmm. you know, Sanders and Gainwell can catch the ball. Like it, it wasn't a personnel issue. It was definitely a deliberate choice. Right. Um, they don't throw it to the run of it. Yeah. And so that's Swift's bread and butter, right? You know, in Detroit, yeah, yeah. he was able to get that 15, 17% target share. And that's really where he scored his points. He can succeed as a rusher in certain situations, although I do think he has some deficiencies in that department. Yeah. Um, but, but Rashad Penny, for my money, is a much better rusher of the football. And honestly, I think he's set to get more of that early down work that Miles Sanders got, where I think Swift is going to be kind of a Kenny Gainwell plus. Like, I think mm. he's he's going to rotate in uh, more so on third downs. 
in some schemed up plays, the way he was kind of used in Detroit last season later on where his usage was very precise. Like his targets per route run was really, really high because they were only letting him on the field when they wanted to scheme up a wheel route or whatever for him. And right. that's kind of what I expect, but more of like a lesser version, just because like I said, the offense doesn't really run through the running backs in the same way that it did in Detroit. So this is a situation where I'm jumping off the ship and I did have some swift and I'm, I am, I'm out. I, I really liked his upside as a receiver, but I don't see it for him in Philly. Yeah, no, I'm I'm out on Swift too. I was not, you know, like I said, I, I wasn't really in on him in Detroit. He just he can't stay on the field. They don't seem to, even when he's on the field, they don't seem to use him as much as his price tag would indicate that he's gonna that he's being used or is going to be used. Um, so now in in Philly, you know, it's kind of yeah, he'll get his he'll have his days. I'm sure, just like every you know every Philly running back will here and there, but. I'm I'm out. I'm going to try to sell him to the highest bidder, basically somebody who does believe that he's going to get, you know, get the workload and get, uh, you know, receiving work or whatever the case may be in Philadelphia. Yeah, that's that's so important because there are people in your leagues that are still going to be swift believers. There's some mm -hmm. anchoring mm -hmm. bias there where he was viewed as such a good prospect. He did enough through his first several seasons for people to really buy in on that upside, that mm -hmm. RB one upside. I was one of them. I thought, you know, if he can put together a full season, he has the target earning ability where he could be a top five running back for a season. Yeah. But yeah. I think we've seen enough chinks in the armor at this point where we should not expect that. I don't think a running back one season is even in the range of outcomes in Philadelphia. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm out. I'm, I'm trying to either package him up to get an elite asset at running back or any position, um, yeah. you know, kind of a high end throw in basically, uh, if you can still get like a 2024 first rounder, you need to take that and run. Oh um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Or you, or you can trade down, you know, out of that range into a lower end running back and yep. pick up something extra. But I really don't want to be holding on to Deandre Swift when the season comes, because I think people are going to be disappointed with the way that he's utilized in this offense. Yeah, for sure. All right, so that's depressing. Uh, let's jump on to another <laughs> falling player. Who else is seeing their value drop post-drafts? Uh, I got another guy, a uh, wide receiver, so we're done. Like you said, we're done with the running backs. Uh, Rashad Bateman, wide receiver of the Baltimore Ravens, uh, coming off of a injury-laden season. You know, didn't know what we were doing with Lamar Jackson. He's locked up. Then they add, or before this, they add uh, Odell Beckham Jr., and they draft Zay Flowers. Um, it just does not look promising for Rashad Bateman's target share in this offense. Um, it's still going to be a run first offense. I don't know if it's going to be as run heavy as we've seen in the past uh, because now Lamar Jackson actually has weapons to throw to. Um, and Bateman is one of those weapons. It's just not like after drafting Zay Flowers, that's basically replacing what Marquise Brown did but i think yeah. we have a little bit of a higher ceiling and trajectory on zay flowers from what we've seen at least at least in my opinion over over hollywood brown um and you add a guy like obj he's not going to be there for forever of course he's he's a vet and a, a nice addition to the offense but bateman i just don't see we haven't we just haven't seen it and coming into the season, it's like, okay, well, he we might be able to – maybe he'll be that guy. And the Ravens are telling us, like, yeah, he's a guy. He's not going to be the guy. We <laughs> brought guy, in right? two more – yeah, we brought in two more receivers. So he's essentially the fourth passing option in this offense when you consider Mark Andrews being the one. Um, so I just think he takes a major hit. I have him in one of my leagues as well trying to figure out – how to get out of this because i'm probably out on rashad bateman unfortunately but he i think he takes a, a massive hit after the draft yeah it's a tough guy to know what to do with because like at least with someone like swift he still holds a lot of residual value for people because we've seen stuff before and right. he still kind of looks like a guy who could get volume so you can you can sell it to certain managers but bateman's kind of a tough sell it's like well we've never seen him have sustained success He's in the same situation where he didn't have success, but he has more competition. It's right. it's very tough. Like I, I liked him as a prospect, and then he's kind of struggled due to some circumstances outside of his concern with injuries and just the mm. offense being dysfunctional in general. But yeah, it's tough. There's so much competition there now with Flowers, Mark Andrews, OBJ. It's it's really crowded. 
And generally, I don't worry too much about crowded wide receiver rooms because mm -hmm. I believe talent wins out. It's just the issue is we don't actually know if Bateman's the kind of talent that will win out. And right. if it does win out, we don't actually know what the ceiling is because this has been a run first offense and will, like you said, probably stay a run first offense, even if the volume goes up a tick. Uh, yeah. it's, it's not likely to be, you know, an above average team in terms of pass attempts. So it's a combination of low floor and low ceiling that just makes him kind of unexciting. You yeah. Know, the, the best yeah. case scenario is kind of like, okay, he's everything we expected and congratulations. You get the wide receiver 18 in points per game. It's like, okay, I guess right. so. Like, right. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Even if this turns successful for him, like what is Rashad Bateman and successful? What does that look like fantasy points wise? Like you said, like, okay, he's going to be, you know, do you get some points for you? But what we thought he was going to be coming out of the draft, especially like I loved Rashad Bateman, you know, analytically watching his tape. I thought he was a great receiver. Mm -hmm. And when he went to Baltimore, I was like, eh, okay, well, I guess they need a guy. They don't have too many weapons. Yeah. And then we just still have not seen it. And the Ravens are, telling us they're pretty unsure about it too so i'm yeah. not uh, unfor unfortunately for bateman that's not that's not somebody i'm gonna be targeting and it's somebody i'm gonna be trying to move off of maybe go yeah go go up and get some someone else or like you were saying trade down and add something on it because he's not he's not gonna be i don't even know where you put him in your line like he can't be your wide receiver three i wouldn't <laughs> i wouldn't yeah. think if you're playing in three receiver uh type of league i i wouldn't I wouldn't suggest putting him there. So I'm, I'm not too sure what to do with him. Yeah. You, you basically, it's like a deep, if you're in a deep league, you can put him in your flex and some weeks he, he might score a touchdown, but it's not a projectable role. You know, it's a guy mm -hmm. you can take in best ball if you want, but right. um, not, not a guy you can project in your lineup. So it's, it's, he's not a guy that I value. Like I don't value that archetype of player, those kind of running back 45 through 55, you know, mm -hmm. range where, they have this potential or that's like, Oh, you know, they don't have the role, but maybe they can grow into something. I, I try to get rid of those guys. I would much rather turn those guys into older wide receivers that can be productive. Like, yeah, like he, like Rashad Bateman, like you could literally just, just go trade him for Tyler Lockett. Like right now, yeah, seriously. I would rather just have him because that's a guy you can actually start. And yeah, right. he's closer to the end of his career, but the rest of Rashad Bateman's career could be like totally it mediocre. Yeah, he, he's his end might be coming up for all we know. Exactly. <laughs> it's a, there's a trap where people fall into this idea of longevity at, with players that don't actually have any guaranteed longevity. Like 22 right. year old NFL players retire all the time. It's all the because time. It, it, you don't only leave the league when you're old. You also end up out of the league if you're bad. Right. Uh, and so that's just that's how it works. Uh, and yep. so I would I would be looking to flip him into a locket, uh, DeAndre Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And this last guy who I'm going to talk about, actually, who you could consider to be a faller that I'm absolutely buying into, which is Keenan Allen. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so this will be our last faller. But so Keenan Allen, right? The situation is the Chargers added a wide receiver in the first round. It was Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. Now it's Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Quentin Johnston. So there's target competition coming in. We're seeing a little bit of like, oh, is this a changing of the guard? Keenan Allen's. 31 years old. And so his value is taking a little bit of a hit. Um, he's pretty stagnant on keep trade cut, not a big drop. I think it's going to vary from league to league, right? Cause it depends on the manager. Some people yeah. are content to hold on to these veteran producers. Some people are like really chasing youth. Those are the people that are, you know, buying Rashad Bateman right now. They're mm -hmm. looking for the youth They're, They want to get younger. It's going to depend on your league, but I have seen enough deals with Keenan Allen being moved for mid second round picks where I know that he's undervalued right now and you can go out and get him. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'll, I promise I'll let you talk here in a second. No, uh, just... <laughs> <laughs> Quentin Johnston is, I, I think he's a fine prospect and he could be a good player. I don't think it's likely that he's going to make enough of a year one impact. That's going to affect Keenan Allen. Right. Like I yeah. think he immediately steps in and steals all of Josh Palmer's lunch money, uh, all of his snaps, all of his opportunities, but honestly, his skill set overlaps more with Mike Williams than it does with Keenan Allen. So, right, right. I think I think things are going to stay pretty stagnant for Allen, as at least for this season. Yeah, I think so, and I, I like that. He, I agree with you. First of all, and I, I like that he is kind of looked at, look, looked on upon, looked upon as kind of a, a faller. Um, because what? Yeah, if they you know use first round draft capital on a receiver, um, 
essentially that's kind of you know you're they're heading towards the direction of keenan allen's almost done this is the direction we gotta we gotta replace um but he still holds tremendous value it's still keenan allen we're talking about he's he's not even the type of receiver like he's not a mike williams where he's you know getting sent down the field all the time he's like a high volume high reception on the field all the time like a route technician type of receiver he could play for another three four years while we know we wouldn't even back we could be looking back on this four years from now like i can't believe we were trying to you know trying to bury keenan allen so so early you know what i mean he he has longevity in his you know in his tool belt so to speak so i i um, totally agree he's never been a guy that relies on athleticism either you know he's a technician and it's kind of like not to compare him to a hall of famer but it's kind of like larry fitzgerald you know Mm -hmm. who was kind Mm -hmm. of written off really early and then he just kept posting like low-end wide receiver one seasons like right Right. through his right through his 30s you can see the same thing for keenan allen he's averaged he's had between 16 and 17 points per game every year from 2017 to 2022 like he is the picture of consistency he he i think he's had 90 plus receptions in every single one of those seasons like he hasn't actually shown that he's falling off right, and right. you know, yes, he's 31. He could fall off. It could mm-hmm. be this season, but if it's not this season, he's going to continue to produce at this same level. And what right. you're giving up for him, it's not high risk. Like if you lose out on a mid second, big whoop, most mid seconds aren't good anyway. Right. Exactly. So go out exactly. and get that guy hit. Basically it's like his range of outcomes for this season hasn't changed and so if people think that it has you need to go out and buy him because he's going to project similarly to guys like jerry judy chris godwin Mm -hmm. marquise brown terry mclaurin even better than those guys who are going you know four or five rounds earlier in startups due to their age so this is kind of your way of getting that same level of production at a much lower cost yeah absolutely if you're going to take a shot you know take a shot on a proven guy as opposed to a random second like you were saying like it's it's still Keenan Allen, guys. Like that, I'm not. I'm not too afraid of QJ right off the right off the bat. I'd definitely be trying to get trying to get him for the low right right now. Yeah, exactly. It's it's honestly, I think he's one of the easiest buys right now. If you are yeah, looking yeah. at a contending roster, like if your team sucks, don't go out yeah, and get a 31 Keenan year old Allen, wide no. receiver. <laughs> but if you have a good team, this is a guy who can start in your wide receiver two spot. Mm-hmm. Like out throughout the season uh and right. you you aren't going to regret that trade like i assure you whatever tank bigsby becomes in the nfl you're not going to regret that you traded him for keenan allen i really really don't think so no. so <laughs> so that that will conclude our risers and fallers and i think those those are really the guys i think that gives you an idea of what you can do with those players yeah uh, before we get out of here uh, i want to touch on some of the debbie stuff because i don't know anything about it and if someone listens to the show the only way they're ever going to learn about Debbie is if they uh, <clears throat> is if they talk to you about it. And and <laughs> on that note, Drew does have a show as well uh, on the Dynasty Football Factory channel. It's called Always Be Building, and mm-hmm. you might find more Debbie content there. So you should check that out if that is something that interests you. That being said, Drew, I know a handful of players coming out next year. Mm-hmm. Caleb Caleb Williams. Uh, I've got I've got uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. Mm-hmm. Um, but outside of that, like. Prospect season for me is like after the Super Bowl. So I don't know what's okay. going on. Tell me a little bit about this upcoming class. Like what should people get excited about? Yeah. So uh, the t- top two quarterbacks in this class uh, are surefire top five picks, in my opinion. Uh, like you mentioned, Caleb Williams from USC uh, and Drake May of North Carolina is another guy that's, you know, he's a big 6'4", 230, 40 pound quarterback, got a cannon for an arm. He's from Carolina anyway, so he's just, you know, a country bumpkin type of player. And he he is he's got it. He's got it. So he's he'll be he's definitely a name to watch. You'll hear him throughout the whole entire season, college season, throughout the process. Like you said, Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh he also has a, a running mate in that Ohio State um uh, wide receiver room, uh Emeka Egbuka, another five star uh wide receiver is actually ranked higher than Marvin Harrison Jr. coming out of coming out of high school, uh, which is crazy to think about at this point. But um, he right now is probably consensus wide receiver two uh, out of the 2024 class. Um, And then probably the next biggest name, I would say, is uh, Georgia's tight end Brock Bowers, um, who was playing alongside Darnell Washington last year uh, at, at Georgia. But he was the 
Darnell Washington was kind of the like he he even says it himself. He's the offensive lineman slash tight end because of how how big he is. Didn't get a whole bunch of targets or receptions or anything. But Brock Bowers is probably one of the greatest tight end prospects we've will ever see coming out of the coming out of the draft. Uh, he's got you know everything you want out of a tight end. He's super athletic. Uh, can make you know circus catches. He's gonna be he's gonna be like immediately gonna be a top twelve. Uh, a tight end in dynasty. Um, so he's he's definitely a high name. There's, there's also some good some good running backs. Uh, Travion Henderson from Ohio State. Um, there's there's tons of good. Uh, Raheem Rocket Sanders out of Arkansas is another big name. Love the name. Yeah, exactly, exactly. He's he's a lot of people's uh, RB one in the 2024 class right now. Um, and then uh, one more name for a running back, uh, Braylon Allen, out of Wisconsin. He is probably for me, one of the most intriguing because he's a real big, real big uh, running back, powerful, but fast at the same time. And I believe he's only 20 years old. And when he gets drafted, he's going to be close to that, like just barely 21. I think he started his fre- his freshman season at Wisconsin. He was playing that whole entire season at 17 years old. So wow. he's yeah. So and he's you know, he's big and can run through people. He's a, he's a scary running back. So. There's a there's a lot of there's a lot of talent in this draft. It's it's not only to, you know front end loaded, but there's some names we'll start to hear throughout the uh, throughout you know watching spring games, uh, you know watching you know Texas and Archie Manning and all that stuff. Obviously, this is not his draft class, but uh, the guy that's ahead of him right now, Quinn Ewers, who's you know one of the greatest QB prospects, uh, you know analytically and, and five star rating type of guys. Uh, that we've seen since he's he's up there with you know with excuse me with Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields when it comes to that that aspect of of you know ranking players and rating them so there's definitely a lot of talent you know of course like you said every time it changes once the draft comes and we're like oh man this wasn't the greatest class that we thought it was going to be <laughs> right but, it's but, like a vicious cycle isn't it's it? a yeah. vicious cycle yeah but there's there's definitely you know some some cachet uh for name value wise or even right now and for 2024 already starting to talk about what arizona is doing at the top of the draft next year so right yeah i i uh okay i love that you jog my memory a little bit i have heard of some of those players um, okay i don't okay. want to sound like a total total novice <laughs> here I, I i have heard the names travian henderson brock bowers i i know those guys but um but I definitely don't know the details of their profiles and you know how they're, how they're actually shaping up for the draft next year. Yeah. So you know we hear it every year. Next year's draft class is better uh, than this one. You need to go get your picks in that class. We we had that happen with 2023. Mm-hmm. It hasn't really panned out. You know we don't know how these guys' careers are going to go. But right now it certainly looks like not quite what we were promised. So mm-hmm. uh, do you think do you think people get a little bit ahead of themselves in that cycle? And at the, at the same time, do you think that it is true that 2024 looks better right now uh, than 2023? So right now, def, it's definitely not as deep uh, in the tight end pool as this year. I think 2023, actually, that did that did hold that it's extremely tight end, uh, well, tight end heavy, but also tight end deep. There's a lot of really good prospects that came out of this draft. Um, and the NFL, the, the process told us that, too. There's a couple guys that went you know, I went pretty high in the draft. Um, so 2024 is not like that yet for tight ends. Um, but the the QBs is probably, you know, four or five of them that by the t- this time next year, we might be talking about five QBs going in the first round. Um, and then receiver is pretty top heavy right now, the two Ohio State wide receivers. Um, and the running back is also getting deeper and deeper as we get you know, even go through the the summer or, or the spring and summer right now. So right now, yeah, I would say 2024, I would lean a little bit, you know, a little bit better than 2023. Um, of course, we have to look at this in a, in a lens of we've seen draft capital. We've seen these players much. We've got much more tape and everything. We have a full extra season of college production out of the 2023 class. But um, I don't think it's over overhyped or overvalued. Like this is the cheapest you can get 2024 picks right now of course uh the price is only going to keep going up on them um so i just like we did last year go get first if you can get first if you can offload you know veteran running backs or Mm -hmm. you know if you're trying to rebuild yes definitely go get the first because they're going to be worth it it's not it's not completely loaded in any one 
uh, one area, one position. The the firsts are are expensive, and they're just going to keep rising. Absolutely, absolutely love it. Yeah, first round picks, they always gain value. They are worth their weight in gold. Go yep. and get them. It doesn't matter what the next year's class looks like. No, they're they're no. going to be more valuable as that approaches. Uh, so I love the the realistic perspective. Tentatively, we like 2024 a little more than 2023. Yeah, but yeah. we're not going to go get out ahead of ourselves. We're not going to trade our you know 106 <laughs> picks for 2024 firsts. No, no, no. Uh, I don't go don't go that. crazy. For me, I I'm looking at 2024 first once we hit around that 110 111 range. Yeah, I'm there content you go. to to ship my pick off. Um, I haven't gotten a lot of takers on that. A lot of people. <laughs> seem to be uh up on the the 2024 stuff a little bit but mm. if you can get that done you know go look for it uh that's a little preview for you of the 2024 class and i think mm. that's gonna do it for us here on the factory tour uh, i want to let you guys know that you should be heading over to dynastyfootballfactory.com sign up for the annual membership you can get access to all of my content all of drew's content on the site you can join our discord hang out with us you can talk to drew about any devi prospects that you'd like to know about i'm sure he knows all about them and uh, you also get access to our rookie draft guide. If you haven't done your rookie draft yet, it's a great resource that you can pick up. It's got film breakdowns, analytical breakdowns on every prospect in the 2023 class. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at Paul underscore DFF. And you can follow Drew at Puma underscore Drew. Drew, why don't you let the people know what you're working on and any final thoughts you might have? Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me on again. Uh, Paul, it's been great. It's a great episode. Hope you guys, uh, you know, tune into all of our, our socials, get on the website, like like Paul was just saying. Um, we got some more stuff coming up on the Always Be Building show. Uh, we're going to talk probably a little bit more about uh, the draft and a couple more landing spot uh, topics. But, you know, as the summer goes along, as we start seeing uh, camp start out in college, especially on the on the Debbie side, uh, we're going to start to you know, give a little bit of uh, sneak peeks into the, a couple of profiles uh, for the 2024 class, especially all the all the top guys um, to, you know, to get the ball rolling on the on the Debbie end. Um, and then throughout the of course, throughout the season, as the show, you know, gain some traction, we'll 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 get a little bit deeper for all the Debbie people, even if you don't play uh, Debbie, we'll you know, we'll be able to tie it in for for Dynasty and for for everybody, anything, anything you're looking for. So, uh, you know, we're hitting the ground running here and really trying to, you know, get this, get this ball rolling. So we're, we're excited. It's going to be a fun spring and summer for always be building. Love it. Love it. All right. Go check out that show. Like I said, follow Drew on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. Drew, thanks for coming on. It's been great talking to you. Hopefully we'll have you back here soon and I will see the rest of you next week on the factory tour.